Thank you. So last week we was going to look at this and then we didn't. We looked at something else. We looked at Ezekiel, didn't we? Chapter 37 about those dry bones. There's a whole lot of shaking going on and about the dry bones. But I'd like to return today to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and think again about the whole theme of being counted in, being a part of of God's kingdom, being a part of the church, being a part of the local body, the fellowship, being a part of something which is a lot bigger than us. Isn't it wonderful? And um, so we're in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, and Phil um, gave the page number, and I can't remember what that is. So some... One... 1816, please do follow along in the Red Bible if you want to. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Okay, so the reason Paul wrote this is really we should see in 1 Thessalonians. But I want to talk about 2 Thessalonians today. But in 1 Thessalonians, he is teaching them, he is correcting them about the coming of the Lord. Because they were having such a hard time and these guys were being so much persecuted and they underwent so much suffering, you know, that they thought already the Lord is coming like right now and which he could right now come at any moment, okay, but some of them kind of were getting confused. So about six months later, um, he wrote another letter, and this is what I want to concentrate today. A backstory, if you're really into your Bible study, if you read Acts chapter 17 in your own time, you will see what happened there on Paul's missionary journeys. Even in the back of your Bibles, maybe not these ones we've got here today, but a study Bible, you can trace Paul's missionary journeys. You will see Thessalonica, you will see Corinth, you will see Asia Minor, you will see all these places Probably not in that order, but you probably see all those things and all those places where Paul went. So although, you know, these things were mentioned in Acts, this is one of the, the letters that he sent them and is writing to them because he wants them to be counted in to the kingdom to make their life count. I told a story this morning um, at Bethesda about how I was at school as a kid. And me with my knobbly knees and my little shorts. And, you know, when you do PE, they call you out onto the field. And it says, right, two teams and the best footballers are the captains. And they get to choose the team. And they say, Griffiths, you'll be on my team. And the other guy would say, Evans, you're on mine, right, but And somebody else would say, Jenkins, you're on my team. And Smith... You're on mine until you're the only one left because nobody wants you. That was me because I was naff at football. There you go. I was good at music. I was good at playing truant. But there you go. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no, but the thing was, that's how we sometimes feel. And it's an awful feeling when you feel left out. And it's like, oh, I suppose I better have Brewer over there. He's going to have to be on my team, reluctantly. And they stick me in goal, because I'm no good. The trouble is, when somebody, when a ball comes, I duck. I don't save it. <laughs> and rugby was even worse. I used to run away from the ball. I don't want to be tackled. Quick, have the ball. It's freezing. It's not nice to be counted out. But God counts you in. So he writes this letter to them because they are going through this suffering, they are going through this persecution, and they might be thinking, oh God, why are we going through this? Have we missed God's coming? Has he been already? Isn't this the great tribulation which, which, it was, which, you know, which we learn about? Is this that? Well, he writes to them, Paul, Silas, Silvanus, and Timothy, he says, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a profound statement. 
He is saying, you are the church, you are the Thessalonians, but you are in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Already you can see the early church are working out their doctrine. They're looking at what they believe and why they're coming to the thing that, yes, there's God, and yet there's Jesus, and God is our God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus is his son. They're already working this out, and he's saying, look, you're already counted in because you are the church, and you are in God the Father. In other words, you are rooted in God the Father. And why is that important for today? The song we've been singing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Because you know God as your Father, that loving heavenly Father. No matter what your earthly father was like, whether he was Good or not so good, loving or not loving, absent or present, God your Father loves you. So they are rooted in God the Father. Don't miss that because we all need to be rooted in God's love. They were rooted in God. Don't miss that. They were also in the Lord Jesus Christ. For you to have fruit You know what I'm going to say. You need to have good roots. Those roots go down deep. And then he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. You can't have peace unless you've received the grace of God. It's the twins of the New Testament. Grace and peace be unto you. Grace and peace peace. You've had twins. Those two things go together. But to have peace with Jesus, you need to know the grace of God. You're going to have no peace unless you've stayed in the grace place. You need the gracey placey for there to be a releasey of the peacey. You know what I mean? You need the grace place to release the peace of Christ. And he's talking here then. He goes, he doesn't hang around as our Paul. He goes straight to the juggler and talks about God's final judgment and glory. So his, his purpose of writing is to explain the end times. And he sees that they are exceeding, exuding in faith and in love. So let's pick up verse 3, uh, one, 2 Thessalonians 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love every one of you, and the love of every one of you, all abounds towards each other. The love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. Their faith is growing exceedingly. That's really important because previously in his other letter in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12, he prays for them and says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. Six months later, the report has come in and he's saying, I thank God because your love has abounded towards another. Your faith has increased. Wow, we, what a church. And he's, and he's telling everybody else about their love. He's telling a bit like an association meeting with all the Baptist churches come together. Oh, this is happening over there, and this is great, and this is happening over there. And you know you went because I couldn't. Your love and your faith is increasing. It is abounding. It is being reported. Wow. They are being counted in. They are in God the Father. They've got grace and peace. Their faith is growing. The love of every one of them abounds to each other. They have exceeding faith and love. And everyone, it says there, every one of you all abounds towards each other. The love of every one of you, all of them are counted in. All of them have been called to play on the same team One body, one church with equal care and concern for each other. Isn't that wonderful? So, he says in verse 4, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. This is the purpose he's writing. 
We count ourselves out when things go wrong. We think, is it me, Lord? Was it sin, Lord? Am I being punished, Lord? Yes, we know that there is godly correction. But it's God's kindness in the first place that led us to repentance. God disciplines those he loves. Yes. Doesn't mean God's left you. For what can separate us from the love of God? Can famine? Can the sword? Nakedness? Whatever. No, in all these things. No, 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 nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For we are more than what? More than conquerors. More than conquerors. That means if you want to be a conqueror, you have something to conquer. And I'm not just talking about the conquer tree outside. There have been lots of conquers this year. Hmm. So explaining the end times, they were exceeded in faith and love, but they had this endurance in the midst of their struggles and trials. Endurance. Not just a Japanese game show, by the way. <laughs> Some of you get it. Endurance means you have staying power. You stay in the race because you're a child of his grace. You stay in the race because God's taught you resilience. It's not your brilliance. It's resilience because he has done it in his grace. It's stay in power. I was sharing at Bethesda this morning about, I was watching a documentary on Netflix about the great storm of 87. You know, the one that Michael Fish didn't see coming and says, oh no, people say there's a storm coming. Oh, I don't think so. And there was a massive storm, wasn't there? And you see, there was a great, you know, it was a late autumn. Well, it was a late kind of, they were, it wasn't like really cold and it was rained a lot. So all the ground was wet in the, made, in the roots of the trees. And there was a load of leaves still on the trees. There hadn't really been a fall, yeah, an autumn. So when these winds come, the trees were so heavy and the roots were so wet. There was devastation, wasn't there? All look, yeah, Kew Gardens became Kew Garden because oh, there was not many gardens there because it had devastating environmental. We was worrying, wasn't we? It would never be the same. I remember grandma in London when she was alive, she says it got so dark. She used to say, hey, duck. Hey, it got so dark, duck, she says. He says it sounded like the wind was coming up, the, the floorboards were lifting and rumbling. She survived the great storm of 87. So 102 she lived, something like that. 104, I beg your pardon, 104, Grandma Brewer, Florence she was called. She was blooming marvelous. Florence, flowers? Florence, yeah. 104 she lived to, and she survived wars, and she, you know, that old, you've survived anything, innit? She was a more than a conqueror, and she's this little lady, tiny little lady. You go, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> she's lovely. Yes. Conquering, staying power. There's something about the older generation, isn't it? They can teach the young people a thing or two. Steady on, Barry. They can teach it. That's why you're needed, you see. When the young people come in, they're going to need the mothers and fathers spiritually now. But they're going to need the grandfathers and the grandmothers as well. To give wisdom. To hear what the young people have to say. And to give that kind of godly wisdom and advice. You see... Everybody's counted in. That's why it's family worship. It's all age. Okay, last week it was pandemonium, wasn't it? You had kids in the pulpit and everywhere. It's marvelous. They're not here today, but hey, they may be back another time. Every week is different. We need to be expectant. Be expectant. They had staying power. We need that resilience, that staying power. So we too can have endurance with patience and hope. He says there, which is manifest evidence, verse 5, of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. The sufferings, if you're suffering, you are counted worthy. If you're going through a hard time, you are counted worthy. God hasn't left you. Don't be bereft. He's right there by your side. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was, um, you know, familiar, acquainted. With grief. A lot of the writers of the Bible ended up being crucified as Jesus was. Persecuted. Martyred. 
The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So we have a lot to give thanks for. We've got so much to give thanks for. So what are we going to do with it? Well, Paul pulls no punches. That's really hard to say. Paul pulls no punches here because he starts talking about that actually, you know, God is coming because he's righteous. He says, verse 6, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Hang on a minute, John. I thought you said God was loving and he wants to save people. Yes, he does. He's appropriated that in Jesus when he died on the cross for us. When he took your guilt and your shame where you go free. Yeah, but if he's a God of love, why do people get, why is he going to become the judge? Because he gives you and me a free choice. God has provided everything. He's done everything possible in giving his son that you and me don't have to live in an eternity without Jesus. In other words, hell. God has done everything. He's provided with you, for you, for everything so that you don't have to go there. By putting your faith and trust in Jesus. But he's talking to them. Just because they're going through hard times and tribulation. They thought it was the end end of the end of days. But he say, well it's not the end end of the end of days. But it's the end of days. But it's not the end end. But he's talking about the end of the end of the end of the days. And he's talking about right at the end. And he pulls no punches. And I tell you what. They didn't flinch. Christians in those days did not flinch. He says... He's going to come. He's going to give you rest. When, verse 7, latter part, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is reality. This, that's why the gospel is good news. John 3.16 for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that all those who believe in him will not perish. Will not perish. In here, Paul is saying they're going to come. God's going to judge those who do not obey the gospel. But you don't have to be judged. Because God's heart for you and for our communities and for our families is that they don't perish. But have everlasting life. This is evidence of God's righteousness because God is righteous. Yes, he is loving. He's also strong. He will come to judge at the end of the ages. He will take vengeance on those who do not know him and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Let that sink in. I can't think of anything worse. Everlasting destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord. That's a relational distance. You see, this side of eternity, we can come in to a relational closeness with God through Jesus. But there will come a time when God judges through Jesus the earth. And all who ever lived, and there will be a judgment, and those, some will be separated from God forever. But they don't have to. What have we been singing this morning? Yes, Lord. In other words, count me in. I want to be in your kingdom. I want to be found in your family. I want my name, my family's name, my children, my grandchildren's and children's 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 name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the heart of a father and a grandfather speaking. That they may be saved from the coming wrath at the end of the end of the end of the ages. See, people don't want God. They say, no, 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 don't give me all that Jesus stuff. Don't give me that alpha rubbish. Don't, 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 you know, I don't want to be baptized. You know, maybe I might go to church at Christmas, but I don't want it. I don't want a relationship with Jesus. 
And basically, at the end of the ages, God has given them what they wanted. You rejected me. Okay. There is separation. You see, this should really... This is motivation for our mission. Because he is coming. He is coming. I believe in the second coming. I believe he is coming again. Yet there are those who will be separated from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of his power when he comes, verse 10, in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So you have a choice here today. Count me in or count me out. But it's time to believe. It's not time to doubt. So work it out. So the last thing is this. He finishes with prayer just as well after that message. Judgment, hellfire, damnation. He's preaching the truth and he didn't flinch. We've got to preach the truth. Therefore, verse 11. (laughs) Therefore, we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling. So first he counts them worthy to be a part of the kingdom because they suffer. Now we're saying, I'm praying that God will count you worthy, that you're going to endure until the end, that you will not fail or fall or falter, but that you will lay your life at the altar. Therefore, we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. In other words, do his will with all goodness and the work of faith with power. In other words, get on with it. Do his will with his goodness and get on with the work with his power. He's given you the power. Why are we still seated here? We should be out. Out. And bring the sheep back in to be trained and discipled. To be sent back out. That's why we're a Baptist church. We are born on the great commission. Our declaration of principle. Each one takes part in the evangelization of the world, baptizing them. We like, that's why we call Baptists. We baptize people in the water and in the Holy Spirit. Fulfill the pleasure of his will with all goodness. Do the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you. How is Jesus being glorified in you? This last week, how has Jesus got the glory in your life? This coming week, How is God going to get the glory in your life? Everything is on our notice board out there. It's all about Jesus. Let there be no mistake about it. You come to Sandy Hill. You're going to get Jesus. You're going to get God, the Holy Spirit. You're going to put your dancing shoes on. You're going to be saved, healed, and delivered. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You are counted worthy of the call for the one who is worthy of it all. God counts you in. Please say yes and go and find some sheep that have gone astray. There are many who live in Tish, whose parents went to Sandy Hill, grandparents went to Sandy Hill, went to other churches around. There are so many connections. They just need somebody just to be a friend to them. That's where it starts. Let me finish with what Jesus said. In Luke 21, Jesus talked about the end times. He said a lot about the end times. In Luke 21, verse 36, Jesus gave a warning. And it's very sobering. And it's very serious. He says, watch. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass to stand before the Son of Man. 
Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy so you can escape all these end time things he is saying that will come to pass, that will happen that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man not in your tattered rags, not in defeat but only by Jesus Christ. His grace, his peace, his love, his righteousness don't you dare count yourselves out count yourselves in and be worthy of the call for the Lord of all let's pray Lord Jesus I love your word we love your word we love to worship we love your presence we love it Lord God when your spirit comes we love it you love your presence but even more than that Lord is the big E called evangelism and Lord we want to be people who would love to be evangelists and to do evangelism and Father God just be just just to be naturally supernatural so God in these days Lord God sober us up Lord God with your word Lord God that you might Lord, that that might be the motivation for our mission because you are coming as the judge. You are coming soon. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. You are the King and you are the righteous judge. In Jesus' name, amen.